Well, welcome to our Monday evening Bible study. It's good to have our brother Victor Maxwell with us for the month of May. And over the next three Monday evenings, Victor's going to bring us three portraits of Christ. Our opening hymn this evening is a well-known hymn, I Know Not Why God's Wondrous Grace. Let's just open our meeting in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you that we have it in our own language. And we thank you that we can read, study, and meditate upon it day by day. 
We thank you that you've brought our brother Victor amongst us this evening. And we just pray, Lord, that you will bless him. And through him, that you will bless us by the reading of your word. We do indeed thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, for all that he means to us, for all that he's done for us at the place called Calvary. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you will bless us this evening. And we ask all these things in our Saviour's worthy and precious name. Amen. Don't forget the announcements for the incoming week. Uh, they're very simple. Uh, Wednesday evening is Kids' Corner at 7 p.m. And then next Sunday at 11.30, our family service. And 7 o'clock, our gospel service. And our speaker is our own brother, Hugh Martin. As I said before, it's a joy to welcome Victor. And we just ask Victor now to come and bring God's word to us. Thank you, Victor. And thank you, Paul, for the kind words of welcome. Always a joy to come to the Iron Hall. Uh, but of course, I miss all the smiling faces and see the folk in their familiar places. But nevertheless, a joy to be with you. I trust that you're managing well with the lockdown. Uh, if you get too depressed about it, think about Noah. He was on a lockdown for over a year. And it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. At least we have been having very good weather. However, it's a joy to be with you here this evening. In the absence of the people, can I say that uh, not only a pleasure to come to the Iron Hall, but it's a joy to have perhaps what is our most favorite theme of all of the Bible, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The book is his book. It's the hymn book. It's all about him. Old Testament announces him. The New Testament, of course, uh, gives to us the Lord Jesus. And then, again, we anticipate his coming again. It's all about him. In coming to you, I would actually thought of going through some of the Psalms at this difficult time in our nation and throughout the world. The Psalms have been especially precious to us, some of the great songs. However, the more I thought about it and prayed about it, the more I felt drawn to another songbook of the Bible, the Psalms, undoubtedly the largest songbook of the Bible, but the book of Isaiah. It may interest you to know that in the book of Isaiah, songs and singing are mentioned more than 40 times. Chapter 5 says, Come and I will sing unto you a song concerning my beloved. In the chapters 40 and through to chapter 53, we have what are known as the Four Servant Songs of Isaiah. And that's where we're going this evening. We're going to Isaiah chapter 52, and we're going to be uh, reading this fourth servant song of Isaiah. In these days, I think just about everybody has been conscious of their own mortality, and perhaps we've lost some very good friends. But it did it ever strike you about uh, someone writing your own obituary before you're actually dead? I say that this evening because when we come to the reading of Isaiah, and especially Isaiah chapter 53, in a sense we're reading the obituary of our Lord. He knew all about it when he came. He lived in the shadow of the cross. His pathway from eternity to Calvary was always in the shadow of the cross. He was as a lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. However, let's go to our Bible reading this evening in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. God always blesses to us the reading of his sacred word. We've already mentioned songs and hymns singing. And perhaps the name of Isaac Watts ranks amongst the greatest hymn writers of the Christian church. Isaac Watts was the son of a manse. He was a, a preacher of the gospel, the author of many books. But he's best remembered for the great hymns that he has written. And they, those were written over 300 years ago. Think of that. Especially when we sing that hymn, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. When Isaac Watts wrote that hymn, he really invited a lot of trouble because people protested that he was bringing too many personal pronouns into the hymn. Were the whole realm of nature mine that were an offering Far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Too many personal pronouns, they said. To that, Isaac Watts reminded them that when you come to the Scriptures, there are many personal pronouns. And especially in this chapter 53 of Isaiah, it's all about him and us. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. There's the personal pronoun. That's us. The Lord led on him the iniquity of us all. When we come to this Isaiah, chapter 53, and we look on it as the servant song of Isaiah, when we think of song, we think of joy. We think of success. And can I say that when we read this, it sounds more like a sob than a song. We associate song with from uh, rags to riches, but this is the story of riches to rags. This is the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. And yet, is it amazing that he was able to sing on the way to Calvary? Why, the book of Hebrews reminds us of why uh, looking to the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. This is a song, and our Savior had joy in his heart, even though he was going to the dark place called Calvary. However, this is not only a song, this is a prophecy. This prophecy was written 700 years before our Lord Jesus came into the world. And yet, for all of that, uh, when you read the description of the sufferings of our blessed Lord, you, you would think it was written in the shadow of Calvary. Isaiah gives to us more details of the suffering and death of our blessed Savior than do the gospel writers. This is prophecy. Winston Churchill is being mentioned a lot this week with the VE Day, the victory in Europe, and the great man himself. But on one occasion, someone said to him, Mr. Churchill, what does it take to be successful in politics? To this, Churchill said, to be successful in politics, you must have the ability to predict what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. You predict it all. And then when it doesn't happen, you've got to have the ability to explain why it didn't happen. May I say, my friend, when it comes to the prophecies of the Bible, we never have to explain why they didn't happen, why God is faithful to his word, and every promise is fulfilled. 
as the apostle Peter wrote, we have a more sure word of prophecy undergirded by the faithfulness of the immutable God of heaven. And therefore, we, we come to this prophecy with great confidence. Speaking of the prophecy, of course, behind the prophecy was the prophet, the prophet Isaiah. The young Isaiah converted when he was a young man, a young man of noble blood. The Bible reminds us in this very prophecy that in the year that King Uzziah died, he went into the temple and there he saw the Lord high and lifted up. It was a life-changing encounter with God. Not only was his heart purified, but his lips were touched with the live coal from off the altar. And he cried, here am I, sent me. For the next 60 years, the prophet Isaiah preached the word of God. And he had to do it with a lot of courage. It wasn't a God-friendly world in which he lived. As a matter of fact, the opening chapter reminds us of the sins of Israel, which he denounced. And thereafter, the chapter 39, he exposes to us the sins of the surrounding nations. He, he was using, as it were, the sword of the Word of God to open the wounds, expose the sin. And yet, for all of that courage, he came with comfort. For where he opened the wounds, he was able to pour in the oil of the Word of God and crying, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. This was the prophet Isaiah. And beyond his courage and uh, comfort, why, here is a man who had great confidence. The, the prophecy of Isaiah in its 66 books, uh, 66 chapters rather, gives to us such a, a, a picture of our Lord Jesus. It foretells the, the manner of his birth. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. It gives to us his name. His name shall be called Emmanuel. It reminds us that unto us a son is given, a child is born. His, the government shall be upon his shoulders. What a composite picture it gives to us of our blessed Lord, not only in his early life, but also here in his suffering at Calvary and beyond Calvary, going to the resurrection. And so this is a prophecy with courage and comfort and great confidence that God would fulfill his word. When we come to Isaiah chapter 53, undoubtedly it's a favorite chapter to many with whom I speak this evening. Those who love the Savior and love the word of God will love Isaiah chapter 53. Martin Luther called it the golden chapter of the Bible. I remember at Sunday school we had to memorize Isaiah 53. And, and when I went to Bible college, phew, nearly 60 years ago, we had to get, again memorize this, this wonderful chapter, the golden chapter of the Bible. You're not alone in loving this chapter. It seems to be that the Apostle Paul had this as his favorite chapter. Forty times in the 13 letters written by Paul, he referred to Isaiah chapter 53. It warmed his heart. And doesn't mention of our Savior warm all of our hearts? We're coming not only to the golden chapter of the Bible. Someone has said that we're coming to the Mount Everest of Old Testament revelation. Here is the heart of the gospel. Here is the heart of God's plan of redemption. And yet Mr. Spurgeon said, we're not coming to Everest. We're coming to Calvary. We're coming to the one who there was put to shame for us. We're coming to our crucified Lord. I said, as Paul has announced, that we're doing three portraits of Christ. We're doing this evening the past Christ in his sufferings. Next week, God willing, we'll be doing the present Christ in his sufficiency. And the Lord permitting on the last study, we'll look at the prophetic Christ and his supremacy. But let's look at this chapter 53 this evening. And just for a few moments tonight, let's think of the following. First of all, when we come to the song, I want us to think of the majesty of this song. Look at Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 13, where it simply says this word, Behold my servant. You know that the word behold means look, gaze upon him. My friend won an invitation this evening to gaze upon Christ. Look upon him. Help me, dear Savior, to take it in what it meant for thee the Holy One, to bear away my sin. Behold my servant. 
It is said of Handel when he wrote the Messiah, uh, that famous aria that uh, we, we love to hear and some love to sing. Uh, but when he was composing it and came to these, these chapters of the book of Isaiah, why tears coursed down his face and stained the manuscript, even as he wrote, reminding him, uh, him that the Lord Jesus was the man of sorrows. He was the suffering servant. My friend, well, may we shed te tears as we come to this portion of the Word of God. Behold my servant. In the majesty of this song, I'd like you to look at the majesty of his glory, for that's exactly, exactly how it begins. Be, behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. I think it not unusual, but it is quite interesting that this servant's song that is filled with suffering actually begins in the glory. Remember the Apostle Paul spoke of, uh, rather, the Apostle Peter spoke to those who had crucified the Lord Jesus and said, Ye have crucified the Lord of glory. My friend, he came from those ivory palaces. He stepped out from the presence of the Father. He came into the world to save sinners. It is the Lord Jesus who himself said that he came from on high. And therefore, when we behold the servant, we behold the servant in his glory. But as we look at verse 14, we see not only the servant in his glory, we see the servant in his grief. As many were astonished at thee. Listen to these words. His visage was more marred than that of any man and his form, more than the sons of men. My friend, can we ever take in the sufferings of our blessed Lord? His visage, his appearance was more marred some translations put it that he was unrecognizable. When we think of the buffeting in Caiaphas Judgment Hall where they socked him and beat him. When we think how they took him among the soldiers and stripped off his garments and the Roman lictor took the whip laced with fine bones and brought it across the back of our blessed Lord turning into the flesh and turning the sinews is it any wonder it says in this prophecy of Isaiah, I gave my back to the smiter and my face to those who plucked off the hair. Thirty and nine times they tore those bones across the back of our Lord Jesus. Did anyone ever suffer like him? As they mocked him and scoffed him and Roman soldiers would have buffeted him why, they put upon him a crown of thorns. They put upon him a purple robe. They scorned him and called him a king. King? But where's the anointing oil? There was no anointing oil. So what Roman soldiers did was they spat upon him. His visage more marred than that of any man. Oh, to think of the grief of our blessed Lord. Was there ever sorrow like that of our Lord? Never, my friend. He went to the place called Calvary. And there, amidst two thieves... They took the body of our blessed Lord and you can hear the thud of iron upon iron as they kneel our blessed Lord to the tree and, and lift up that cross and there the crucified Christ stretched out on the cross as a lambskin in the midday sun and there he is, God's altar. He did it for us. My friend, creation looked on and the Father turned out the lights as darkness fell on the face of the earth and there in the darkness our Savior prayed, when we think of the sufferings of our Lord, we look on those outward sufferings of our Lord, but if we could look in upon the window of the heart as it does in Psalm 88 and see the great billows that had gone over his soul and how he felt the abandonment of the Father, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I ask again tonight, was there ever grief like his? I'll say this, there was never glory like the glory of the Lord. There was never grief like the Grief of our blessed Lord. But if you look at verse 15, it reminds us not only of the, of the glory of our Lord and the grief of our Lord, it reminds us here of the grace of our Lord when it says this word, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Remember, the sprinkling was the, the function of the priest. 
at home. We've been reading the book of Exodus in chapter 25 where the people entered into the covenant to keep all the law of God. They said, we, we will obey the word. Aaron was commanded to take the blood of the lamb and with that blood he was to sprinkle the nation, sprinkle the nation. I wonder did Peter have that in mind when he spoke how that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has not only chosen us but we have been sprinkled by the blood. Peter wrote and said, you who are not a people are now a people. You are a holy nation sprinkled by the blood of Christ. My friend, thank God that from Calvary's cross there flows grace. We sing the hymn, Grace is flowing like a river. Millions there have been supplied. Still it flows as free as ever from the Savior's wounded side. And my friend, I tell you this, thank God because of Calvary, grace is touching all over our world. The Bible reminds us on that day they shall come from the east and the west and the north and the south and they will sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of the Father. What a day that is going to be. John asked the question, who are these who have come out of great tribulation? These are they who washed the robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Thank God for grace tonight. However, behold my servant in his glory, my servant in his grace, my, 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 my servant in his grief and his grace. Look at what he says at the end of this verse uh, 15. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Remember I said that I, the Apostle Paul loved to quote the book of Isaiah. That's exactly what he did in Romans chapter 15. He said these words, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ is named, lest he should build upon another man's foundation. Then he said, For as it is written, that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. He was speaking of the preaching of the gospel. My friend, can I say that's, that's what is happening today. The, the word of God going out, all over the world. It's a grandest theme for the mortal tongue. Our God is able to deliver. What, what a message he's speaking here of the gospel going out. Oh, perhaps we've taken too long to speak tonight of the majesty of the song, but it is a majestic song. Can I say a little bit about the melody of this song? When we come to chapter 53, we, we're entering into 12 verses, but when we Put it together because the song of Isaiah begins in 52. When you take the three verses from Isaiah 52 and add it to the uh, 12 verses of 53, you have 15 verses. However, in Hebrew prose, these 15 verses are divided into five stanzas, each taking, as we have three verses in our English Bible, divided into five parts. Some commentators thought that it was so divided into five parts in Hebrew uh, prose because of the five books of Moses. They were important. And if you look at this song, you will find that the five books of Moses are represented here, the books from uh, Genesis through to Deuteronomy. However, I tend to agree with those other commentators who say that not so much do we have the five books of the law or the Torah, but here we have the five Levitical offerings. If you go to the book of Leviticus chapter 1, you will find that God had revealed to Moses the offerings that must be offered upon the altar of the tabernacle. There were five Levitical offerings. And you will find that there's a parallel in them in our blessed Lord. For example, the first of the offerings was the burnt offering. That offering was an offering that was wholly given to God. It was wholly consumed by the fire on the altar, wholly given to God. My friend, that corresponds with the first stanza, as we see it in Isaiah chapter 52, his visage more marred than any man, or his, uh, and his form more than the sons of men. This is the Lord of glory, wholly consumed. The second offering is the offering of the meal offering. 
The meal offering was flour with oil and it was offered upon the altar. And I say that this evening because when you come to the second stanza, which takes in the verses 1 through 3 of Isaiah 53, it reminds us that he shall grow up as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. Remember the Lord Jesus said, the corn of wheat must fall into the ground and die. And this is the sense of the tender plant, the crushing in the meal offering. The third offering is the peace offering. The peace offering was a very important offering that had to be offered by the, the priest, but it does take in, in parallel, the verses 4 through 6 that we've been reading off this evening. I say the peace offering, listen to these words, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. This is our Lord Jesus. And then we have the sin offering. Uh, the sin offering takes in the verses 7 through 9, and those include the words, he shall make his soul an offering for sin. Our blessed Lord was not only the burden bearer, he was a sin bearer who his own self bore our sin on his body on the tree. And then the trespass offering, he was numbered with the transgressors, the trespassers, this is the Lord Jesus. Don't you see this evening that here is our blessed Lord Jesus? The melody of the song is all about Christ in his sufferings and all that he did for us. Oh, when I think of him and think of the path that he tread, it took him to Calvary. Think of the pain that he felt. He did it on the cross of Calvary. My friend, think of the people he saved. Listen, he was wounded. We are healed. We went astray. He bore it all on his body on the tree. This is our Lord Jesus. The majesty of the song, the melody of the song, the mystery of the song. There's a lot of mystery. In Israel today, when they read this, it's hard to believe that they do not see the Lord Jesus they believe that this chapter is all about Israel and their sufferings. It is true that no nation on earth has ever suffered as much as the nation of Israel or the Jewish people. However, in all of their sufferings, their sufferings are not redemptive sufferings for us. I mean, they, they bore all of this suffering, but they didn't take our place and die for us. We are not redeemed by Israel. Uh, someone will say to us that these are uh, to be understood nationally. Some say they are to be understood personally. They are the sufferings of Isaiah. I said Isaiah preached for 60 years, and it's true. And when we read Hebrews chapter 11 and read of those who suffered and some who were sawn asunder, some believe that that referred to Isaiah. But it could not be Isaiah. Because in this chapter, it reminds us that no guile was ever found in his mouth. That could not be Isaiah. In chapter 6, Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips. He needed to be purged. But not so our blessed Lord. Listen to what Peter said. He did no sin. No guile was ever found in his mouth. He took upon himself our sins on the cross. He bore them for us. I say again this evening, the mystery of this is not to be found in the nation of Israel. It's not to be found in the life of the prophet. But rather it's to be found in our Lord Jesus. And the answer comes to us in the book of Acts chapter 8, where the evangelist Philip when he saw, transported by the Lord to the, to the wilderness, and there he met this, the Ethiopian returning from Jerusalem with a copy of the book of Isaiah in his hand, and he's reading. And the Spirit of God said to Philip, go join yourself. He climbed onto the chariot, and the eunuch shared with him. He, he said, of whom does the prophet speak? Does he speak of himself, or does he speak of another? And the Bible says that from Isaiah chapter 53, Philip, beginning, beginning at the same scripture, preached unto him Jesus. My friend, 
the mystery of this chapter is not a mystery. We see Christ, behold my servant. The majesty of the song, the melody of the song, the mystery of the song, the miracle of this song. How did Isaiah know what would happen to Jesus? I mean, 700 years. We can't tell us what's going to happen next week. We're waiting for the prime minister to say what might happen next week. We couldn't foretell what's going to happen next year. But think of this prophet giving 700 years. Do you know how he knew? It was revelation. Revelation. God revealed it to him. Not only revelation, but inspiration. Uh, that is the Holy Spirit who revealed it to Isaiah. He brought that word and preserved it through the centuries. And the amazing thing about this prophecy is not just the revelation revealing it, but the fulfilling of it. Go to John chapter 19 and read of our blessed Lord on the cross. Before he cried and said, into thy hands I commend my spirit, the Bible says that Jesus, knowing that all things had been fulfilled. Isn't that amazing? Our Lord Jesus, my friend, writhing in agony on the cross in the darkness of that hour, but with his mind, he he scales all of the scriptures, scans all of the scriptures, and knowing that all was fulfilled, he gave up the ghost. That's the miracle. Oh, but none of us ever knew how deep were the waters crossed or how dark was the night that our Lord passed through or he found the sheep that was lost. But my friend, it was all wrapped up in the revelation of God and the completion of the work upon the cross. I want to finish this evening just by saying something about the ministry of this song. You see, so often we have read this chapter, Isaiah chapter 53. I have been speaking tonight about the majesty of the song, the melody of the song, the mystery of the song, the miracle of the song, wonderful things. But the question must be asked, what does it mean to you and to me? The, these words of Isaiah, uh, as they come from the page to our heart, how does it touch us? Count Sindendorf, Ludwig Sindendorf, he had studied at Heidelberg University in the 17th century. After studying at Heidelberg, he went on a tour of Germany and France to visit the great art galleries of that day. When he came to the city of Frankfurt, he, he went into the, the Frankfurt Art Gallery and there he saw Fetty's masterpiece of the crucified Christ. He looked at it and studied it. And flooding into his mind were the scriptures who his own self bore our sin on his body on the tree. He looked at it. But at the bottom of the painting, Fetty had written these words. All this... I did for thee. What hast thou done for me? Those were the words that touched Ludwig Stindendorf and propelled him to take the gospel to the ends of the earth in the Moravian mission. The founder of a Moravian mission. All because of those words. All this I did for thee. What hast thou done for me? 200 years later, in the 19th century, a young lady from Wales, Frances Ridley Havergill, she really is from England, but she lived in Wales. She was visiting France on her way to a health spa, or visiting Germany, rather. She went to exactly the same art gallery that Sindendorf had been to. She came to the painting that Sindendorf had looked and saw again the crucified Christ and she took time to look at it and think upon it. And then she went near to read those words again. All this I did for thee. What hast thou done for me? Frances Ridley Havergill was so moved that she took a pencil in her hand and on a piece of paper she wrote these words. My life, my life was given for thee. My precious blood was shed that thou mightst ransom be and quicken from the dead. 
My life, my life was given for thee. What hast thou done for me? A good question. I think we best answer it with the words of Isaac Watts as we began tonight. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love, so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father tonight, how we thank you for such a wonderful Savior. We thank you for your secret word, not only predicting the death of our blessed Lord Jesus, but providing with us this great message of the gospel so that we can take it to the ends of the earth. Bless this word to all who listen in this evening. And we do pray that you will bless each family during this lockdown time. Be with them, we pray. May the comfort of the scriptures come to comfort their hearts each day and the confidence of the Lord's presence with them be a strength to them each day. Bless this church and its witness. And in the ongoing days, our Father, our eyes are to thee. We pray that you will bless the doctors and nurses and the staff of our hospitals who care for us and care for the sick. Bring comfort, our Father, to the many bereaved homes. And our Father, we pray that in your sovereign way, you will guide our government so that we may be back to days when the gospel can be preached and the people of God can meet. Accept our thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Our closing hymn tonight, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. Thank you. Thank you.